Good day to all of you. So we're already on the 17th chapter of the Operating Systems Lecture, which is all about protection. So to know more about this topic, so let's start our lesson. So again, chapter 17 is all about protection. So the contents of this chapter are, we have the goals of protection, principles of protection, protection rings, Domain of Protection, Access Matrix, Implementation of Access Matrix, Revocation of Access Rights, Role-Based Access Control, Mandatory Access Control or MAC, Capability-Based Systems, Other Protection Implementation Methods, and last but not the least, the Language-Based Protection. So, these are the following objectives for this chapter. First is... Discuss the goals and principles of protection in a modern computer system. Explain how protection domains combined with an access matrix are used to specify the resources a process may access. Examine capability and language-based protection systems. And last but not the least, describe how protection mechanisms can mitigate system attacks. So the following uh, we, uh, topic is we have the goals of protection. So, in one protection model, computer consists of a collection of objects. So, these are classified or categorized as hardware or software. And then each object has a unique name and can be accessed through a well-defined set of operations. So, we have this protection problem. So, ensure that each object is accessed correctly and only by those processes that are allowed to do so. So the principles of protection is we have this guiding principle which is called the principle of least privilege. Actually, this is already mentioned in the previous chapters. So let's go back and uh, recapitulate or refresh our memory with regards to this principle. So programs, users, and systems should be given just enough privileges to perform their tasks. So that is the principle of least privilege, meaning... Um, um, executing those programs um, should have at least a priv enough privilege to finish the task, for example, of a particular program or a user or a system. And then properly set permissions can limit damage if entity has a bug or it gets abused. And this can be static during life of system or during life of the process or it can be dynamic. Um, it can be changed by process as needed. So, by means of dynamic, we have domain switching, of course, by the word itself. Uh, you're going to switch domains. And then we have privilege escalation. So, I already have an example of privilege escalation, such as, for example, if you are a guest, uh, if you have the guest account, and you, if you want to be an administrator, all you have to do is you have to know the username and password of the administrator so you can have a full control to modify and access the system. And then we have this compartmentalization, a derivative concept regarding access to data. So this is the process of protecting each individual system component through the use of specific permissions and access restrictions. Again, let's go back with the guest account. So for the guest account, you can only uh, view you can only view the data, but you can never modify it or, of course, um, delete it, such as like that. But if you do have an administrator account, so that will be the time that you can have the full control uh, for, the, uh, for the files. So it's also an example, for example, in a uh, Google Drive, in which if you are... If you are uh, if you're one of the collaborators and if you're only allowed to view, then you cannot, um, you cannot modify it. But if you have, if you really are the owner, for example, if if the the original author or the owner of the file lets you to be the owner or collaborator, then you can modify the file. So must consider grain concept. So we have two types. We have the rough grained and fine grained. So rough grained, the uh, privilege management is easier, simpler, but least privilege now done in large chunks. 
So for examples of this, these are traditional Unix processes either have abilities of the associated user or of root. And then another is we have fine-grained in which the management is more complex, uh, more overhead, but it is more protective. Examples of this are file ACL lists or access. Um, uh, we have ACL, the access control list, and we have the RBAC or the role-based access control. So the domain can be user, process, or procedure. And then we have this audit trail, recording all protection-oriented activities, important to understanding what happened, why, and catching things that shouldn't. So audit trail is very important because um, if your system has a problem or it has been jeopardized, then by means of audit trail, they can check what happens, uh, what, uh, what occur, what is the reason why the error occur. You can see it in the audit trail by investigating or looking into the log of the audit trail. And then next is we have no single principle is a panacea for security vulnerabilities. So panacea means a cure or medicine. Um, so we need defense in depth. So to, to illustrate defense in depth, example, your house. To protect your house from robbers, so for example, you have a gate, and then your gate has a lock, and then you have uh, the main door, and then the main door has a uh, screen door, and then that screen door also has a lock. And then your main door, uh, of course, it has a primary lock, but for you to have more protection, you've added uh, three or more locks. So that is the meaning of defense in depth. Okay, next is we have the protection rings. So components ordered by amount of privilege and protected from each other. So for example, the kernel is in one ring and user applications in another. So that is the, the essence of protection rings to separate, uh, for example, of course, kernel mode and example, the user mode. So this privilege separation requires hardware support. So gates used to transfer between levels, for example, the syscall Intel instruction, so for Intel. And then it also has in, uh, traps and interrupts. And then we have hypervisors. So hypervisors, this run the virtual machines, or another word, these are called the virtual machine managers. So introduce the need for yet another ring. And then ARM v7 processors added trust zone or TZ ring to protect crypto functions with access via new secure monitor call or SMC instruction. So these ARM processors, these are used by smartphones. So typically they are running Android operating systems. So protecting at NFC secure element and crypto keys from even the kernel. So NFC means the near field communication. So we have this um, illustration of protection rings that is used by Multics. So let D sub I and D sub J be any two domain rings. If J is less than I, then D sub I is a subset of D sub J. So we have this ring, so the outer ring, the ring N minus 1 is for the users. And then the ring 0, which is um, in color yellow. So it means that if you will have access to this ring, it means that you have all the control, the full control of the system. So it's like a privilege escalation. So if you know the password, then you will be, uh, for example, of the administrator, account then you will be here in the uh, innermost ring so we have the android use of trust zone as already um, introduced in the previous slide so all of the applications has a folder of com that android that application so this is the illustration of the steps so for the first step application in need of cryptographic services uses android framework so this um that com and that android that application will access the key store and the gatekeeper from the hardware abstraction layer so that's step number two so step number two frameworks use vendor supplied hardware abstraction layer to communicate with the daemon after this frameworks are, are used by the uh 
by the uh, application. So the third step is the vendor supply privilege user mode daemon issues request to driver. So this will uh, uh, request to driver. So it will be um, labeled as trusted. So we have the TC daemon such as we have QC com. And then this is uh, SVC service. And then it will enter the kernel mode. Then from the kernel, we have the TZ driver. So only kernel mode is allowed to access the trust zone or the TZ. So vendor driver makes request, and if the application is signed, um, digitally signed, meaning it is trusted. So um, the TC driver will label that application as trusted. So it will be included in the trusted applications. So the applications in Android actually are supplied by the third party, uh, actually by the Android or the vendor or the uh, Linux. So since this is an application, so and it is uh, uh, signed by the vendor, so it will be included in the vendor. So as you can see in the default settings in Android, we have um, allow installation to unknown sources. That is the way of their protection so that uh, your, uh, your system or the smartphone will not be exposed to applications that are not digitally signed because if there are, if there a problem will arise so of course it will not it it will make your system be vulnerable to attacks so that's why they have this um mechanism but um it's it's up to uh, it's your own risk to um check that so the again the applications uh, installed application to uh, in an from unknown sources okay next is we have the arm cpu architecture so in the 64-bit arm v8 architecture so arm extended its model to support four levels so we have the four levels here we have the el0 we have for the user el1 is for the kernel and then el2 is for the hypervisor and el3 is for the secure monitor extended levels the meaning of EL. So any of the exception, so any of the exception levels allows running separate OS side by side. So if you can see, um, the ARM architecture can um, run other OSs side by side. And then as you can see here for the EL3, which the secure monitor, this is the trust zone layer. So again, hypervisor is the uh, virtual machine manager. And as you can see, EL1 kernel, if you're running other OS, so they have their own uh, OS kernel. Okay, next is we have the domain of protection. So rings of protection separate functions into domains and order them hierarchically. And then computer can be treated as processes and objects. So hardware objects such as devices or any tangible parts and software objects such as files, programs, and semaphores. Process, for example, should only have access to objects it currently requires to complete its tasks. We have this principle, the need-to-know principle. It does not need to know other uh, resources or uh, that, that it doesn't need at the time, only that particular resources for for the process to finish its task. And then implementation can be uh, via process operating in a protection domain. So from the protection domain, this is specify resources the process may access. And then each domain specifies set of objects and types of operations on them. And then ability to execute an operation on an object is called an access right. So the uh, notation or format for uh, the uh, the object and the access uh, rights to or steps or or access that can be steps actions that can be made to the object is we have the rights set and then also domain may share access rights and associations can be static or it can change anytime dynamic if dynamic processes can domain switch so the domain structure is, of course, as uh, I already uh, mentioned, this is denotation. 
So access right is equal to the object name and the right set or the actions that can be done to the object where right set is a subset of all valid operations that can be performed on the object. And then domain is equal to a set of access rights. So we have three domains here. We have D sub 1. So these are the access rights available for D sub 1. We have object uh, 3, 1, and 2. So for object 3, you can read and write, and also for object 1, while object 2 is only for execution, so the operation is execute. So, okay, we have the D sub 2 and D sub 3. As you can see, uh, as it is said, domain can share access rights. So that's why domain sub 2 and D sub 3, uh, they share access rights for the object 4, and then the operation is print, while domain 2, we have object 2 and then the operations for object 2 is right. And then for D sub 3, we have uh, object 1 is execute and object 3 is for ri uh, right operations. So this is an example in which um, domains can share an access rights or one or more access rights. So what is the domain implementation that is used in Unix? So the domain is equal to user ID and then domains which accomplished via file system. Each file has associated with it a domain bit or the set UID bit. When file is executed and set UID is equal to on, then the user ID is set to owner of the file being executed. So when execution completes, the user ID is reset. Another one is using domain switch accomplished via password. So the first is via the file system and then domain switch can be accomplished via passwords. So we have su command temporarily switches to another user's domain when other domain's password is provided. And then another way of domain switching is via commands. We have the sudo command prefix execute specified command in another domain if original domain has privilege or password given. So I, I uh, have an experience of using the Linux system and then in the terminal. So for you to, example, install a program, you cannot just install it uh, in the terminal. It will uh, always notify you that you need to have, uh, a super, uh, you need to be uh, an administrator. So the command that you're going to do is, or execute or type is we have the sudo bash, B-A-S-H. So typing that command, executing that command will give you and access rights to full control, such as example for installation of software in the Linux. So bash, B-A-S-H. So uh, actually bash is used in, in social media to ridicule someone, but here bash is used for, uh, have, uh, for you to have full control of the system, it's for you to modify, for you to customize, so that's why we have, again, you're going to use the sudo bash. Okay, so how about the domain implementation used in Android app IDs? So in Android, distinct user IDs are provided on a per-application basis. So when an application is installed, the installed daemon assigns it a distinct user ID or UID and group ID or GID along with the private data directory, so the path is slash data slash data slash the app name, whose ownership is granted to this UID or GID combination alone. And then applications on the device enjoy the same level of protection provided by Unix systems to separate users. And then a quick and simple way to provide isolation, security, and privacy. So the mechanism is extended by modifying the kernel to allow certain operations such as networking sockets only to members of a particular GID. So for example, is we have the AID INET 3003. And then a further enhancement by Android is to define certain UIDs as isolated, prevents them from initiating RPC or uh, remote procedure call requests to any but a bare minimum of services. So we have this access matrix. So view protection as a matrix or as it is called access matrix. And then the rows, we have the rows here represent the domain. 
So, this is for domain 1, domain 2, 3, and 4 respectively. And then columns represent objects. So, we have F sub 1, F sub 2, F sub 3, and printer. So, you can assume F sub 1 to F sub 3 are files. And then we have access IJ is the set of operations that a process executing in domain sub I can invoke on object uh, sub, uh, sub J. So, for example, in domain 1, um, it has a control over um, F sub 1 and F sub G. So, domain 1, you can read the file and also F sub G. Um, in blank meaning, they have no control for F sub 2 and printer. They have no access for that um, object. And then next, D sub 2. So, D sub 2, um, if you're here in this domain, you can only use the printer to print. And then it has no access to F, F sub 1, 2, 3. And then for domain sub G, so it has uh, access to F sub 2 and F sub G. So we have for F sub 2, it can read F sub 2. And for F sub 3, it can execute. And then for domain 4, so it has access with uh, F sub 1 and F sub 3. It can read and write F sub 1. And the same with F sub 3. The same. Um, writes set or operations. So the use of access matrix. So if a process in domain D sub I tries to do operation on object O sub J, then operation must be in the access matrix. Of course, it is true because if it is blank, then it has no access to that particular object. So user who access uh, who creates object can define access column for that object. So, it can be expanded to dynamic protection. So, operations to add, delete, access rights. So, these are the special access rights if you are the owner of the object, O sub i. Or copy operations from O sub i to O sub j denoted by the asterisk. The operation, and it has as the asterisk, it means you have the copyright. And then control, we have D sub i can modify D sub j access rights. And then you can also transfer switch from domain D sub I to D sub J. So, copy and owner are applicable to an object while control is applicable to domain object. So, access matrix designs separates mechanism from policy. So, again, the difference between mechanism and policy. So, for mechanism, operating systems provide the access matrix plus the rules. And, uh, it ensures that the matrix is only manipulated by authorized agents and that rules are strictly enforced. And then for policy, so the user dictates the policy and then this policy, who can access what object and in what mode. But this doesn't solve the general confinement problem. So we extended the access matrix that is, uh, you, uh, that is already presented in the previous slide so, of figure A with domains as object. So, for you to switch from one domain to another, it added for uh, the domain to be an object. So, that's, that's why the uh, dynamic protection. So, it means in D sub 1, aside from these um, access rights, D sub 1 can switch with D sub 2. Can go to D sub 2. And then D sub 2, the domain D sub 2 will... Um, can switch from uh, D sub 2, then going to D sub 3 and D sub 4. And then for D sub 3, it cannot switch to any domain. And then for D sub 4, it can switch with D sub 1. So we have an example or illustration here of access matrix with copyrights. Okay, so with copyrights, as discussed in the previous slides, so the operation, it, it has an asterisk meaning. So we have here an example. So, D sub 1 has the copyrights of right for F sub 3. And then, D sub 2 has copyrights for F sub 2. Meaning, for this, you can copy. So, that's why copyrights. You can copy the operations um, that, is, uh, that is under F sub 2 as with the same here with F sub 3. So, this is the first figure. In the second figure, so we can see that D sub 2 copy the uh, read operations to F sub, uh, to D sub 3. 
So as you can see prior, so D sub 3 does not have any um, operations in F sub 2, but because of this um, read, then it is, uh, uh, you, uh, the D sub 2 can copy the operation. So that's why D sub 3 has already the um, operation read. But for this, for F sub 3, for example, it, why it's just the same, maybe D sub 1 um, did not copy the other uh, the operations for D sub 2 and D sub 3. So this is only the example that it can copy um, the operations under that particular object. Okay, next is we have the access matrix with owner rights. So as you can see, for D sub 1, we have owner owner so it means that um, d sub 1 is the owner of the object f sub 1 and then d sub 2 is the owner of uh, the f sub 2 and uh, and also the owner of f sub 3 and then of course unfortunately d sub 3 does not have any um, not an owner of any of the object so example this one so since um, d sub 1 is the owner f sub 1 so you can see the comparison in d d sub 3's access rights is removed because it is removed by d sub 1 so if you are the owner of the object you can add delete or modify the the operations for that particular object so that's why in d sub 3 it was removed the execute um, operation okay next is we have this one so since this is the owner so of f sub 2 so we can see here that um, d sub 3 has already the operation for right as modified by d sub 2 and it also modified itself from we have the read and then we have the um it has the right on the next um, illustration and then next is we have also d sub 2 is the owner of f sub 3 so the read and write so that's why um d sub 2 copied the operation of write to d sub 3 so again if you are the owner of the uh, object you can add um modify or delete uh, all the uh, all the operations under that particular object okay next is we have the modified access matrix of figure b so as we can see here so this is the one okay we are uh, rather this one because it has domains as objects so the difference here is that we have the switch control so meaning if you have this for example for d sub 1 and d sub 2 d sub 3 and then d sub 4 it's only switch so by means of switch control it can modify the operations or it can modify the domain so it means that for d sub 1 to d sub 2 it's only uh, switching from one domain to another then d sub 2 to d sub 3 and d sub 4 to d sub 1 but the difference is that d sub 2 to d sub 4 if it is a switch control so d sub 2 can modify the access rights in d sub 4 so we can see here d sub 4 is right but as you can see with the previous um, matrix it has read for f sub 1 and f sub 3 objects so it means that d sub 2 uh, modified the operations in f sub 1 and f sub 3 in which uh, the, this domain, the domain d sub 2 removed the read operations from f sub 1 and f sub 3 objects. So that is the difference with the switch control. So next is we have implementation of access matrix. So generally a sparse matrix. So the first option to implement access matrix is by using the global table. So the store ordered triples, so we have the domain, the object, and the right set in table. A requested operation M on object O sub J within domain D, then search table for D sub I, O sub J, and R sub K as following the um, notation. 
And then with M is an element of R sub K or the right set. So the problem with a global table, it can be large. So the problem here, of course, won't fit in main memory and difficult to group objects. Consider an object that all domains can read. So another option is by use of access lists for objects. So each column implemented as an access list for one object. So resulting per object list consists of ordered pairs. So the domain instead of object and right set here for access list for objects is uh, the one that is uh, in the notation is the domain and just the same the rights set defining all domains with non-empty set of access rights for the object. Easily extended to contain default set if M is an element of default set also allow access. So to continue option two, so each column is equivalent to access control list for one object. Define so can perform what operation? So for domain one, you can read and write. And then for domain two, you can only read and also for domain three. And then each row is equal to capability list or like a key for each domain, what operations allowed on what objects. So for object F1, you can read for object F4, you can read, write, execute. And then for object F5, you can read, write, delete, and copy. So the next implementation is option three. We have capability list for domains. Instead of object-based, list is domain-based. And then capability list for domain is list of objects together with operations allows on them. And then object represented by its name or address called a capability. And then execute operation M on object O sub J, process requests operation and specifies capability as parameter. So possession of capability means access is allowed. So capability list associated with domain but never directly accessible by the domain. Rather, the protected object maintains by the operating system and access indirectly. It is like a secure pointer. And then the idea can be extended to applications so the fourth one is we have the option uh, fourth option is the lock key so it is a compromise between access lists and capability list so each object has list of unique bit patterns called locks and each domain has a list of unique bit patterns called keys so process in a domain can only access an object if domain has key that matches one of the locks so it's like a a uh, typical lock and key. If you do not have the key for that particular lock, you cannot use the um, operations there. So it's, it's, it's just the same analogy with the real world lock and key. So comparison with implementation. So many trade-offs to, con trade to consider such as global table is simpler or simple, but the problem with that is it can be large. And then access list corresponds to needs of users. So determining set of access rights for domain non-localized is so difficult. So that is the disadvantage of access list. And then every access to an object must be checked. So if there are many object and access rights, so it will be slow. And then capability lists useful for localizing information for a given process. So but revocation capabilities can be inefficient. So lock key effective and flexible, keys can be passed freely from domain to domain and it has easy revocation. So most systems use combination of access list and capabilities, which is option two and three. So first access to an object is the access list is search. If allowed, capability created and attached to the process and additional accesses need not to be checked. After the last access capability is destroyed, so this is used for the file system with ACLs or access control lists per file. So next is we have the revocation of access rights. So various options to remove the access rights of a domain to an object. So we have this immediate versus delayed. So the key question here for first uh, this comparison is, does revocation occur immediately or is it delayed? If revocation is delayed, can we find out when it will take place? So that is the question for immediate versus delayed. 
Then next is we have selective versus general. So when an access right to an object is revoked, does it affect all the users who have an access right to that object? Or can we specify a select group of users whose access rights should be revoked? So selective, only this group, this number, or the revocation, is it general? If, if this uh, right will be removed, so it will be removed to all, true to all. And then we have parcel versus total. So can a subset of the rights associated with an object be revoked? Or must we revoke all access rights for this object? And then for temporary versus permanent, so the key question here is, can access be revoked permanently? So permanently meaning that the revoke access rights will never again be available. Or can access be revoked and later be obtained again? So that is the, you have the points to consider for the revocation of access rights. So next is we have access list, delete access rights from the access list. So the advantage here, it is simple, search access list and remove entry. And then it can be immediate, general or selective, total or partial, or permanent, permanent or temporary. It depends upon your preference. Okay, for capability list. Scheme required to locate capability in the system before capability can be revoked. So, it can be uh, reacquired or reacquisition. So, we have periodic delete with require and denial if revoked. And it can also use back pointers, set of pointers from each object to all capabilities of that object. So, it is used in multi system. And then we have indirection. Capability points to global table entry which points to object, delete entry from global table, and it is not selective. This is used by the CAL system. And then for keys, unique bits associated with capability generated when capability is created. So master key associated with the object, key matches master key for access. And then for revocation, create new master key. And then policy decision of who can create and modify keys is object owners or others are it depends upon the decision if is it is it the object owner or or others or other objects that who is not the owner of the key okay next is we have the role based access control or the RBAC so protection can be applied to non file resources so the operating system uh, that implements this role-based access control is the Oracle Solaris 10. So to, this to implement uh, list privilege. So privilege is right to execute system call or use an option within a system call. It can also be assigned to processes. And then for RBAC, users assign roles granting access to privileges and programs. And then enable role via password to gain its privileges. And it's also similar to access matrix. So this is the illustration. We have user 1, for example. And it has a role. So it can be one or many roles. So it has a role 1. And then it has uh, two privileges. So privileges 1 and 2. So by, meaning, uh, by using of this role, so executes with role 1 privileges to the process. Okay, next is we have the mandatory access control or the MAC. So operating systems traditionally had discretionary access control or DAC or DAC to limit access to files and other objects, for examples, for Unix file permissions and Windows access control list or ACLs. So discretionary is a weakness. Uh, why? The reason is the user or the admins need to do something to increase protection. So the stronger form is mandatory access control, which even root user can't circumvent. So by mandatory access control, make resources inaccessible except to their intended owners. So modern systems implement both Mac and DAC, with Mac usually a more secure optional configuration, and it is used by trusted Solaris, trusted BSD, which is used in Mac OS, SE Linux, and Windows Vista Mac. So at its heart, labels assigned to objects and subjects, so it includes processes, 
So, when a subject requests access to an object, policy is checked to determine whether or not a given label holding subject is allowed to perform the action on the object. So, next is we have the capability-based systems. So, Hydra and CAP systems were first capability-based systems. It's actually in the 1980s. So, now included in Linux, Android, and others based on POSIX that one e that unfortunately never became a standard so for this uh, capability based systems essentially slices up root powers into distinct areas each represented by a bitmap bit fine grain control over privileged operations can be achieved by setting or masking the bitmap and then there are three sets of bitmaps that is used we have the permitted the effective and inheritable and then this uh, sets of bitmaps can apply per process or per thread. Once revoked, cannot be reacquired. So process or thread starts with all the privileges, voluntarily decreases set during execution, and then essentially a direct implementation of the principle of list privilege. So an improvement over root having all privileges but in inflexible. So uh, you cannot add new privilege. It's difficult. So, because it is inflexible. So, we have an illustration here of capabilities and POSIX.1E. So, we have an uh, illustration or a scenario here. So, in the old model, even a simple ping utility would have required root privileges because it opens a raw or the ICMP network socket. So, ICMP is stands for Internet Control Message Protocol. So by means of capabilities, it can be thought of as a slicing up the powers of root so that individual applications can cut and choose only those privileges they actually require. So for ping utility, it will just also use the cap underscore net underscore row. And it will not, uh, that's why cut and choose. And it will not care about the other slices because ping does not need these other slices so with capabilities ping can run as a normal user with again as i've said it needs the cap underscore net underscore raw set allowing it to use icmp but not the other extra privileges so other protection improvement methods so we have this system integrity protection or sip this is introduced by Apple in Mac OS 10.11. So what does SIP do? So restricts access to system files and resources even by root. Uses extended file attributes to mark a binary to restrict changes. Disable debugging and scrutinizing. Also, only code signed kernel extensions allowed and configurably only code signed apps. So, aside from SIP, we have the system call filtering. So, it is like a firewall for system calls. Can also be deeper, inspecting all system call arguments. So, the system that's used system call filtering is Linux. It implements via the SECOMP BPF. So, SECOMP means secure computing with filters. And then, BPF, of course, is the Berkeley packet filtering. So, specifically... Uh, the second that Linux uh, implements is uh, the BF BPF or the again the Berkeley packet filtering. So we also have sandboxing. I already discussed the concept of sandboxing, but then again, let's refresh our memory so we can again uh, remember our additional details for sandboxing. So running process in a limited environment. So, impose set of irremovable restrictions early in start of a process before the main function. Process then unable to access any resources beyond its allowed set. And then Java and .NET implement at a virtual machine level. And other systems use Mac to implement. Apple was an early adapter of sandboxing from Mac OS 10.5 seatbelt feature. So, for the seatbelt, seatbelt feature of Apple, so dynamic profiles written in the scheme language, managing system calls even at the argument level. But now, Apple uses already the SIP, a system-wide platform profile. So, for sandboxing, again, the simple idea here is uh, if you have an application and you're not sure if it is 
safe or not to execute it, if you have a sandboxing application, you can run it there. Um, if it if wrecks havoc because of it contains malware, so it can only affect the sandbox program. It will not affect the system. So it's very convenient for developers or um, programmers to use sandboxing tool or software or application. Okay, next is we have code signing allows a system to trust a program or script by using CryptoHash to have the developer sign the executables. So code as it was was compiled by the author. If the code is changed, the signature will be invalid and some systems will disable execution. Then can also be used to disable old programs by the operating system vendors such as Apple, co-signing apps, and then invalidating those signatures so the code will no longer run. So next is we have the language-based protection. So specification of protection in a programming language allows the high-level description of policies for the allocation and use of resources. So language implementation can provide software for protection enforcement when automatic hardware-supported checking is unavailable. So, interpret protection specifications to generate calls on whatever protection system is provided by the hardware and the operating system. So, we have an illustration here how this protection is implemented in Java 2. So, protection is handled by the Java Virtual Machine or the JVM. And then a class is assigned a protection domain when it is loaded by the JVM. And then the protection domain indicates what operations the class can and cannot perform. If a library method is invoked that performs a privileged operation, the stack is inspected to ensure the operation can be performed by the library. Generally, Java's load time and runtime checks enforce type safety. And then classes effectively encapsulate and protect data and methods from other classes. Okay, so we have this stack inspection. So, what happens here is that here the GUI method, so this is the GUI method of a class in the untrusted applet protection domain performs two operations. So, the two operations are the get, you're going to get the URL and of course open, we have the open the address. So, get URL is an invocation of this method of a class in the URL loader protection domain, which is permitted to open sessions. So, that's why we have the open uh, to the sites in the lucent.com. So, in particular, a proxy server. So, this is the proxy.lucent.com for retrieving URLs. So, for this reason, the untrusted applet get invocation will succeed. Actually, it will succeed. The check permissions call, so we have this check permission, in the networking library encounters the stack frame of the get method, which performed its open in a do privilege block. However, the untrusted applet's open invocation will result in an exception. So this open and then this address A. So why? Because the check permissions call finds no do privilege annotation before encountering the stock frame of the GUI method. So though it will succeed, but later on it will be uh, it will not um, be executed because again, as the check permission, the it does not have do privilege annotation. So it will be eventually be halted or stopped. So, this is the operation for stack inspection in Java. So, we're already finished with Chapter 17. So, I hope you've learned all about protection schemes that is used in uh, many of the operating systems. So, if you do have any questions, so please, please feel free to comment below and please do not forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. So, again, thank you very much. Good day and stay safe.